Welcome deer hunters, managers, and enthusiasts. This is Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. My name is Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. Bronson and I are professors of wildlife management and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. Together, we've researched deer across the United States for more than 40 years. In our podcasts, we explain the why and how of deer management based on science. Whether it's research we've conducted or explaining research done elsewhere, we'll offer you a college course in the science of deer management. But don't let Steve scare you. This isn't going to be a review of calculus or chemistry. Instead, we take results of research, reduce it to what's important, and explain how you can apply research to management. So join us for this episode of Deer University. Hey everyone, this is Bronson. Uh, Just a few notes before we get going with this next episode uh, that's going to be about flooding and uh, the effects of flooding. Some good, uh, a lot bad, and especially what's going on now is, is really bad. Uh, Steve and I recorded this a few weeks ago at the end of June and uh, right before we had to scatter for various travel and so I'm getting back to this and getting it uploaded. Uh, It's now the the third week of July and the situation has gone from, uh, well it hasn't improved one bit, Uh, certainly just getting worse and worse as time goes on. Uh, For those that don't know, this is a historic flood in Mississippi with all the floods we've had over decades and decades the the extent of this one in terms of duration uh, is is unprecedented nothing that we've seen like this in our lifetime Uh, my colleagues estimate that uh, the the southern region of the Delta the Delta region of Mississippi uh, is about three-quarters of a million acres are affected to some degree. Uh, As a result, we have deer that are displaced. We have a lot of deer having to live on really, really small acreage. Uh, And of course, their habitat is being severely overbrowsed. They are confined to levees and and places like that. And so we are reaching a a critical situation with, with the deer herd in that region. Uh, As a result, the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks has lifted their supplemental feeding ban, or they've suspended it temporarily, uh, in this CWD zone so that supplemental feed can be be provided uh, to the deer in this area to hopefully keep uh, a great proportion of them alive and and maybe get them through this flooding event. Um, At this point, we're not really sure about potential regulatory changes this fall uh, in terms of hunting. We just don't know what the effect is going to be until it's over. So we know that in some places we certainly have several more weeks of dealing with water. Uh, Unfortunately, there might be some places where we may be dealing with water for a month or longer. So we just really don't know um, what is going to happen in terms of hunting season and again, like I say, the fawn crop antler development and things like that. Um, We just don't know at this point. Uh, One thing we can tell you is that the MSU Deer Lab through this podcast, Deer University, and our social media sites through Mississippi State Extension Service, etc. We're going to keep you up to speed on all the changes, what's going on, potential regulatory changes, and what you can do as a hunter or a landowner. So thank you for listening in. Uh, This episode is titled uh, The Impacts of Flooding on Deer, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Welcome back to Deer University. This is Steve Damaris and... I'm Bronson Strickland. And we're so happy to have you join us again. Uh, Always great topics and, you know, it's raining out today, Bronson. Once again. Once again. been raining a lot yeah and and it's a a really interesting statistic about the rain this past year what yeah it's the uh since may 2018 until april 2019 the wettest 12 months in recorded u.s history yeah that that's a pretty wet year absolutely wet year and uh here in mississippi we tend to have wet winters you know, it was just, it was like raining and raining and raining. Mm-hmm. And and it was a, you know, we like it when it rains in, in other times of the year because, you know, plants are actively growing. And there's, there's cool season plants growing in the winter too, so we like 
to get it stimulated, but maybe we were just a little too stimulated this year. Yeah, it, it really bit us, too, because um, we were admittedly a little late. There's always some, um, you know, October for us here at our latitude where we're at Mississippi, October is typically pretty dry. We have the late summer, the thunderstorms and some rain, you know, happens then and uh, into September. But typically, you know, if you look at a 20-year average, October is pretty dry. And so that's kind of when we do a lot of our food plot planting is in October. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's finally dry enough to till the soil. Um, And so we were ready to go. You know, next week it should be dry enough to plant. The next week, the next week. And the next thing you know, it's Thanksgiving. Yeah. And then December rolls around. So, yeah, some of our fall food plot research didn't happen. Yeah. And now a couple of years ago, the opposite happened. It was so dry you never got... We got everything in the ground at the perfect amount of time, and then right at six weeks in the ground before we got the first rain. Yeah. So plant growth was behind where it normally was. Yeah. So weather is unpredictable at best, uh, Mm -hmm. and this was a really wet year and it over the entire country. And so there's a lot of we we hear a lot on the news about flooding and places being flooded, and you know historically. We, you know, places, the towns were built along major river systems for transportation and commerce, Mm -hmm. and those towns get flooded, and and then in, you know, 1900s, a lot of efforts to build levees to protect those towns, a lot of changes in our waterways over the, the last 50 to 60 years that have affected some natural processes flooding is not a bad thing is it no it can be great it's uh well when you think about um i guess a small flood uh, a slow flood we're not talking about a dam breaking and water just you know screaming across the the environment of the terrain but yeah uh water or flooding brings nutrients and so it adds silt nutrients it can revitalize an area and you know, we've seen that, Steve, over the years with some of our, our studies. Yeah. Is that we'll see some positive effects of flooding. A lot of people think it's just negative, but we've even seen it with the deer herd. It can be have some positive effects. Yeah, so as the water leaves the bank of a river, it spreads out and slows down. And so the silt mm-hmm. in that water, because the water's slowing down, kind of just falls out. That's, that's right. And that f- silt is essentially kind of fertilizer. That's right especially since a lot of that silt ran off of some Midwestern ag field that where they had been putting a lot of fertilizer. Silt from Illinois and Iowa yeah. deposited in Mississippi yeah. and Louisiana and Arkansas. Absolutely. Yeah. So flooding ha- has always happened, and it's historically, from a natural perspective, it's a good thing. If you have land that's being flooded, not a good thing. Right. So the Corps of Engineers over the years have built these levee systems along the Mississippi River and and other major river systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you build that levee, you essentially, it's kind of a demarcation, like behind the levee, on the the people side of the levee, it's protected. On the river side of the levee, it's kind of no man's land. People can do stuff out there, Mm -hmm. but it's going to get flooded. Right. And even more so, um, when you think about you're building the levee, you're, you're protecting either side of the river. But in between those two levees, of course, when the water rises above the normal river channel, it can't spread out like it did 100 years ago. You're keeping it confined within those two levees. So if you have land or a structure inside the levee, then, yeah, the waters can rise a lot and, and cause a lot of damage. Yeah, and that, that land in, in between the levees is called? The Batcher. The Batcher, yeah. B-A-T-T-U-R-E, I believe derived from French, the Batcher land. That sounds good. Good enough. You can't prove me any different. Batcher, so, the Batcher. May, maybe so, yeah. maybe so. That's how the French would mm-hmm. probably not say it, but <laughs> I am I have a French heritage, De Marais is my last name, so oh. I can say De Marais 
battue. I'm going to go with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these, these batcher lands tend to get flooded and worse so than historically because the water can't go anywhere. So it gets deeper mm-hmm. in that batcher land than it normally would have because it can't spread out. Right. Right. So people generally don't do commerce, build factories and things in that land because it's regularly flooded. Mm-hmm. Or more regularly flooded and deeper, yep. and so a lot of the land there, and, and there are significant amounts of land, particularly along the lower Mississippi River, that is batcher, thousands and thousands of acres. Certainly. So, what's the best use of that kind of land? Well, if you're into the outdoors, like you and I are, it is a great place to grow a deer herd, and it's a great place to hunt ducks. Absolutely. So, deer and waterfowl. Yeah, so between the levees, particularly, you know, along the state of Mississippi, Louisiana, and, you know, my experience in, in Arkansas, the same thing, and uh, I don't know how far north that the extensive batcher lands go, but Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, lots and lots of thousands and thousands of acres, mm-hmm. primarily owned by people that recreationally hunt. Right. Uh and and the houses they build are up on stilts because they know they're going to get flooded. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's recreational land and, and, and wonderfully uh, productive recreational land. Um, yeah, it, and it's something they expect. I mean, that's why you're building uh, your hunting camp, your structures on stilts, 10, 15, how many ever feet off the ground, probably more like 15 or greater feet off the ground. It's a normal process. Yeah. Um, what's a lot different right now, Steve, as you know, is duration. Mm-hmm. And so and, e- e- every year we see some flooding to some extent in some places, mm-hmm. but it, it's just far greater this year. Yeah. And, you know, people talk about a hundred year flood or a 500 year flood. Those f- t- time frames were like back before North America was changed dramatically to what it is now. If you're talking about a 500-year flood, well, 500 years ago, North America looked nothing like it does now. Right. So uh, not only the duration, but the frequency of these 100-year floods, people you know, might think, well, wait a minute, we've had three 100-year floods in the last 10 years. What's going on? Mm-hmm. Well, it's because that time frame, that it, it doesn't make sense to refer to a 100-year or 500-year flood. It's now that we've got the world that we have, how often is it going to flood? Pretty darn frequently. It, it certainly looks that way. The more land you have cemented or paved or in farmland upriver, you're going to have more runoff coming into the river systems that lead into the Mississippi River, the Ohio River, and, and you know, all the various rivers that Tennessee River flows. And all this runoff it's come down and the core has built these tall levees to constrain it but we've got more frequent flooding and deeper flooding and more duration now and then couple that with uh, the wettest year recorded yes. so all those reasons you talked about the structures and agriculture and, and those types of respects and then add snow and water on top of that and where we're at Um, We're not at the mouth to the Gulf. That would be Louisiana. But um, I don't know exactly, but it's right at 30 states. I mean, I always think of uh, about 60% of the U.S. The Mississippi is going to be the the ultimate watershed. Yeah. Draining over half of the uh, lower 48 U.S. area. Yeah. A significant amount of water coming through. And so rainfall in Ohio does affect the flood in Vicksburg, Mississippi, flood yeah. stage. Yeah. yeah. And there's been a, some limited research, kind of, what's the word, serendipitous, uh, just dumb luck uh, yeah. research looking at flooding effects in the past. Uh, our The founding father of the MSU Deer Lab, Harry Jacobson, had collared deer on Davis Island, which is part of Mississippi, but it's actually on the Louisiana side of the river in that Batcher land. Mm-hmm. 
eight, 9,000 acre island. Mm -hmm. And he had collared deer there and the island flooded. And what did he learn from that? They'll come back. That um, if the extent of flooding is not too great, so think about water coming in slowly, the water slowly rising. Um, deer have seen that uh, year after year to some extent. They know where to go on the island to ride out the flood, or they just leave the batcher, uh, go across the river, climb the levee, and then be on the other side, be on the protected side of the levee. Yeah. And so you see lots of deer doing that, just year in, year out. They know when the water starts rising, move to higher ground. Yeah. And now, what what was different? What was different in? 2011 was that we had a a flood uh, similar to what we have now in terms of the the height of the the river inside of the levee um, got to a height to where there was no high ground in the batcher land yeah and so our colleague Don White also had some bucks collared University of Arkansas at Monticello. Monticello, that's right. Had some GPS technology then and and don't quote me Steve, but it was something around it was over 10 and less than 15, maybe it was 11 or 12 bucks that had GPS collars and if I remember correctly, some of those bucks moved to some high ground probably where they've always gone in the springtime to ride it out. Uh, the other half of those bucks went on the other side of the levee. So swam what, whatever part of the river channel, got over the levee, and when the water kept rising and kept rising and kept rising, the bucks that stayed on the island inside of the, the levee in the bachelor land, they ultimately died. So that was, that was 2011 was one of those 500-year floods. Yeah. And we've got another 500-year flood Mm -hmm. Or maybe worse. Yeah. Uh, we had one in 1927 also as the a 500-year flood. flood, the, the Great Flood. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a 500-year flood in 2011, and this one, the current one is off the, you know, off the books, uh, mm -hmm. huge duration-wise. Right. And so it's another 500-year flood in the yeah. last, you know, it's two in the last nine years. Yep. Um, so back to my earlier point is don't worry about calling them 500-year floods. It's just kind of the, what are we doing now? This may be the new norm. Yeah. Not saying this will happen every year, but it's, it appears it's going to happen more often than every 500 years yeah. or every 100 years. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but to kind of jump back before we start talking about the current flood, we, uh, because of the interest in how deer responded to the relatively regular flooding of the Batcher lands, we used our wonderfully extensive and large database that Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks uh, provides to us from all the harvest data for all the deer collected in par as part of the DMAP system. Mm -hmm. Louisiana has a DMAP system too, and have we told the listeners, by the way, that DMAP stands for Deer Management Assistance Program? Deer Management Assistance Program. And it's, it's widely used throughout the eastern United States, and that actual approach to deer management was developed here at Mississippi State in the late 70s mm -hmm. uh, as a, a first, uh, uh, an early research project by the MSU Deer Lab to help state agencies collect data on, on harvested deer. Yeah, so that's part of the agreement is that a biologist can't be all over the state of Mississippi collecting harvest data. And so the, the relationship is if you educate hunters and let hunters collect the harvest data from the deer on their property. And, you know, that's where the, the, the data sheet at the skinning shed kind of came from. Mm -hmm. Pulling a jawbone, recording uh, body weight, antler dimensions, lactation status, that was... Uh, all part of that project. Yeah. And then as a favor or in return for those biological data on those private lands is then a DMAP biologist every year 
interprets those data. Yeah, ages of the deer jaws, yeah. and then says, all right, this is what's happening in your deer population. Exactly. Yeah. And there are also some incentives, you know, extra deer tags and things like that. So it's a, it's a great management system, so effective that it's been adopted by dozens of states, state mm-hmm. agencies. So it's a tremendously successful program for the last 35 years. Mm-hmm. Generates a huge amount of data. Uh, how many data? How many harvest data points do we have? How many deer? We are approaching. It's it's not a million, but I probably within the next year or two we're going to have a million records, harvest records, spanning back to uh, with Mississippi back to 1991 is where we have a really big data set. Data were collected before that. But our big data set, the system that we use, goes back to 1991. That's just in the state of Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. And and so other states have you know replicated this system and have databases. So when we were asked uh, to answer the question, well, how do these floods affect our deer populations in the Batcher? We didn't just be restricted in Mississippi. We went to Louisiana. And, and worked with their biologists to access their DMAP database. And, mm-hmm. and then we have this brilliant research cooperator, Phil Jones, mm-hmm. uh, who we gave this data to and, and worked with some other people still beyond that. And we ended up with like 30-something years of harvest data and 30 years of flood timing and duration and extent data mm-hmm. in Louisiana and Mississippi for 61 different properties. Huge, yep. huge landmark example of of data analysis. Yeah, yeah. And, and the map is impressive when you look at the all the different properties uh, just south of Memphis, you know, all the way down to, gosh, right at Baton Rouge, right? Yeah. North of Baton Rouge a little Mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a lot of river frontage, a lot of different properties. Yeah. And so that all those data points and all those years allows us to answer really generally what happens to deer during floods of differing times and durations in Mississippi, Mm -hmm. which, again, I don't want to brag on us too much, but it's a pretty dang impressive analysis that Phil led for us. He sure did. And did as we're sitting here talking about this, I'm thinking, we should have had Phil come in and sit with us. Yep. Hindsight's 2020. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but as as you and I know, it's actually after hours. Uh, we're squeezing in this because we needed to do it. We're both hitting the road for some traveling, and, and so this is kind of a squeeze mm-hmm. it in quick and, and uh, get it ready for production and, and distribution. Yep. So, sorry, Phil, that you're not here. Uh, we'll do our best to represent your Hope we results. represent you correctly. Yeah. yeah. So, start start uh, telling us what we learned. Okay. Uh, real general is we probably sound like we are, uh, well, we are repeating ourselves, but I guess reiterating that flooding is an annual process. Uh, in the Batcher lands in Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas. Most every year, I guess I can't sit here and say every single year, but most years on some places and to some extent in duration, there's going to be flooding. So deer have evolved um, to respond to the water to some degree. Um, So probably what they're using, you know, just think of a, a, a fawn following mom. You got a five or six or eight year old doe. She's kind of figured out the river. She's kind of figured out what to do. That knowledge is passed on to offspring. And, you know, so they learn as the ebb and flow of the river, mm-hmm. move out and move back. Um, the question is, though, the current year when you're having a normal flood is what is it going to do to the deer herd? So there is an acute response, the way I like to think about it. There's an acute response during the spring and summer and winter that we have these floodwaters. 
It has moved the deer potentially out of their normal home range. What are the effects of that? Um, and the acute response is really something we can't measure because we're looking at harvest data. Mm -hmm. So what is happening to that deer physiologically in April may or may not be what we record in November, December, January. But at the same time, Steve, that's really in terms of our clientele and probably people listening are hunters. Yeah. And so they're really wanting to know this fall when I get back out there, what the heck's going on with the deer herd? Yeah. Are should the deer going to be down should, 20 pounds? Should I even harvest any does? Did it wipe out every fawn? Yes. Is antler size going to be diminished? Oh, my gosh. Should I even go hunting this fall? It's going to be so bad. Yes. And the neat thing about our database is because it was 30 years, rainfall patterns differ from year to year. Some years the flood can start as early as December and be mm -hmm. done by January. Yep. Some year, another year, it's going to not flood until February and, and may last for three months. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have all these permutations or, or variations of flood timing and duration and extent. So, right. uh, so yeah, so we, we learned that we've got a lot of variation in flooding, and that allowed us to look at different well, what, response-wise, we looked at body weights of yearling does. Changes in body weight. And right. yearling does because they're... Well, you tell, tell us, why do we choose yearling does? Uh, number one, uh, we know their, their age. We're, you know, 99.9%. .9 we know we have an accurate age from that mandible. Uh, and they're typically the most sensitive. Now... Another segment of the deer herd that would probably be a little more sensitive. And I remember some of the guys that, that brought me up when I moved to Mississippi. Uh, they always claimed, this was pre-four-point rule, uh, which started in 95 in Mississippi, mm -hmm. the single best sensitive indicator of a deer herd, especially related to habitat density relationships, is a yearling buck. Yep, antler size of yearling antler bucks. Antler size of yearling bucks. That goes back to the like literally the 1940s in New York. Some of the early uh, management research up in the Northeast showed that the percentage of spikes in the yearling age class is a super mm -hmm. accurate reflection of that year's habitat conditions. Yep, and we see the same things here. You know, yeah. prior to that. They're now, a great indicator. Because we have antler restrictions in the state, we can't use yearling bucks because they're all protected. That's right. So we use yearling does because yearling does aren't protected, and, and most properties are harvesting does, and a, mm -hmm. a reasonable number of yearling does get harvested. Right. Right. So we have that as a, a, a what's happened to the young deer, and then we, we want to measure reproductive success. So how do we do that? We Typically, we'll then look at our older females. Um, we'll look at lactation rate for them. We can look at body weight as well, but there, there, there's a lot more uh, competing factors going on with the body mass of an adult. So we have the complication of the environment interacting with reproduction as well. Um, but regardless of that, a, a very... Uh, what can be a sensitive metric at the population scale with a sufficient sample. So I'm not talking about collecting five lactation samples, but 30, 40, 50, you know, 100, or if you're looking at a region, thousands of samples is lactation rate. And so that is, we don't know on a lot of these properties, we can't go back and say exactly this was reproduction and this is what recruitment was. But we can look back and we have an index of change from year to year by looking at what was the lactation rate. Yeah. So lactation rate is the percentage of harvested three and older does that are lactating. Yeah. Showing milk, expressing milk at the time of harvest. And, and we're picky here. We break it down even further. We break it down to two and a half and three and a half plus. Yeah. Because two and a half will generally be ten to fifteen percent lower than three and a half. Yeah. yeah. 
And so that gives us an indication of addition of young animals to the population. Mm-hmm. And then we wanted to look at antler size because, you know, every hunter, whether they admit it or not, they're interested in antlers. Right. And so we wanted to look at how does this flooding affect antler expression. But we couldn't do it with yearling bucks. And, you know, a lot of our past work has been looking at two-year-old bucks. And that's worked in most parts of the state. But the batcher is kind of a a different set of lands because generally they're involved in pretty serious trophy management. Mm-hmm. Um it's large land holdings, and, and they're doing a lot of trophy management. Let me make a comparison. <clears throat> Some people, oh, I know a lot of people would understand this. If you were in Texas or familiar with Texas, there's Texas for deer hunting and deer management, and there's South Texas. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I kind of, the, the, the Delta and the Batcher, those are the people that are very, very serious uh, spending a lot of time and a lot of money, and one, one of their primary goals is managing for older aged trophy bucks. Yeah, I mean that that's a place in Mississippi where Boone and Crockett's are harvested every year. Yeah, and so there, there are some two year old bucks harvested in in on many properties in many years, but oftentimes they're harvested as what we would call a a cull, some people management like that, buck. a management buck. Yeah. Uh, you know, So there's younger bucks being harvested, but for management purposes. And so you don't know what you're getting when you, you look at that data. Was yeah. that buck killed because it was a, a lower, smaller antlered size buck for his age class? Or was it a mistake by somebody that, or maybe it was a kid that shot their first buck? And, and so you just don't know about that. So in this analysis, looking at antler size, we chose the best buck per thousand acres on you know a five or seven or eight thousand acre management unit as just kind of an indicator of you know we know those best bucks are being harvested as trophies so we wanted to look at the sensitivity of the top end bucks to flooding and let, let me circle back just to kind of reiterate that point. So for our, our math and stats kind of people, um, we did not think we would get a random sample That's of right. bucks. That's kind of the bottom line. We thought um, we did not know the purpose a hunter was using often. Was it harvested as a maybe a trophy buck or was it harvested as a, a, a management buck? And so we just did not feel that we had a good random sample by age class of the bucks. Mm -hmm. And so that is why we opted for, we know that the top end is sought after every year and will be harvested every year. So we we looked at those bucks for every property. Yeah, it's a special case unique to this particular analysis. And so we, we looked at young animals, physical development, reproductive success as indicated by lactation and then antler expression in top end bucks Mm -hmm. and we had these winter floods spring floods summer floods short floods long floods extensive floods not so much extensive floods all this variation and I, i remember kind of to some extent being disappointed initially it's like Phil didn't, Phil's analysis didn't show these huge impacts that I thought, man, we're gonna we're gonna get people really excited because we're gonna show how much the flooding affects deer population. Yeah, Phil had to make a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. What did you do again? How did? Let, let's look at this another way. Yeah. Uh, and no matter how we looked at it, no matter and, how you sliced it, and, and we're not playing with the numbers, we're just making sure we're not making mistakes. Mm-hmm. And we showed that, given the the extreme range of flood events, we saw relatively limited impacts. Mm-hmm. And and some of them were even positive effects. Mm-hmm. So. The positive effects we, we rationalize or explain based on that, that siltation effect. Yeah, and, and recovery time. 
so where we saw, uh, I think, across the board in every metric, I'm not sure about antlers uh, in hindsight, but uh, with the body weight, with lactation, is that these very frequent winter flooding events all had a positive effect, mm-hmm. a positive effect on body weight, a positive effect on reproduction. So completely counterintuitive, but then when you think about, um, well, we're getting that, hopefully, that, uh, that influx of, of nutrients again on the landscape before spring green up, mm-hmm. and then spring green up happens. Uh, the deer were probably not displaced for very long, or they were doing what they normally do. Yeah. Um, and then, in terms of recovery time, then they still have all of spring green up, all of summer with no flooding. And then that's why, you know, we think, looking back, well, now it kind of makes sense. We, it, it can be a positive effect. Yeah. And that's what the data showed us. And, and kind of going back into natural systems, I mean, yeah, flooding is a positive thing mm-hmm. for natural regeneration of the soil. Yeah. So it did make sense after we thought about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, the idea of the, the normal processes happening later can be impacted by a flooding event during the spring or reaching into the summer because you're affecting spring green up. Mm-hmm. Now, we didn't necessarily show a huge impact of spring flooding either. No, we did not. So what, what's the deal there? Well, I, I think, again, uh, I think there's still time to recovery. We're in a region uh, of the state that is dominated by agriculture. So we have, this, uh, we have this soil, first of all, and we have this flooding event. Um, so we have this abundance of natural forage. Um, then, to top that off, it's not a supplemental food plots, but it's, it's beyond that. It is um, full-scale agriculture adjacent to the river. So uh, on, the, the, on the state side of the levee. Right. So it's not being flooded, but it's being planted in soybeans oftentimes. And soybean, yep. Soybean number one, corn number two. Okay. That's right. So the deer leave the batcher and they go feed in the soybean field. Yeah. And so even if they're behind a little bit, uh, potentially compensation is occurring. Mm-hmm. But just about an unlimited amount of high quality food. Yeah. And, and the batcher is flooding in the spring, but the natural vegetation around those ag fields is going through spring green up. Mm -hmm. So they're getting spring green up, plus a little later on, the soybean planting. Right. So it's not so bad. Right. And then what I found really interesting once we figured this out is when they go back, well, the spring green up that would have normally happened but didn't because it got flooded might happen two months later. So... Instead of coming back to plants that are on the kind of the down slope on quality, it's spring green up all over again. Yeah, delayed spring green up. So they go over the levee into the state side and eat soybeans, benefit from the spring green up there, and they come back after the flood recedes and they go through another spring green up. Mm -hmm. So it was like, wow, this is really interesting and and complex and we better be careful that we don't just say flooding is bad right now it can be terribly bad for people and their access and you know a lot we're not talking about that right we're talking about for the deer winter floods and not too extreme spring floods not not so bad at all maybe even positive right yeah well, it's like we always say, right? Um, it depends, mm-hmm. and you got to put things in context. Um, and you know, what are the details? Yeah. And so when we started teasing apart the the details and the it depends, uh, it's a pretty interesting story developed. Yeah. And then we get into summer floods, early late spring, early summer floods, and uh, particularly the year of those floods. That's when we started seeing some negative effects. That's when we started to see some negative effects. So now we have, um, and then again, depending on the extent of the flood, you start thinking about um, when ag fields are wet, they may not be planted 
So you may not have some of these situations where you can have access to soybeans in some of these circumstances. Um, but also, we're later in the year now in terms of gestation mm-hmm. and in terms of antler development. So whereas we talked about where we began this discussion back in the winter time, um, even though there might be this acute form of stress uh, in winter, late winter, early spring, there's still until deer season six, seven months that a lot can take place. Food is typically available. They can eat and overeat and compensate, and bam, when it gets to be October, looks pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. Not the case when there's floodwaters in June yeah. or May and what appears to be July. So we saw fairly significant negative impacts on heavy late spring, early summer flooding on yearling doe weights and lactation rates. And lactation, yeah. So we have this timing and, and complex situation where it depends on the when it happens and the extent and duration. It can really be not so bad, positive, or bad, yeah, but not nearly as bad as we thought. Right. So let's. All right. So that that was an amazing analysis. Thirty years, huge amount of data, and then we get this year. Mm-hmm. You know, like you said earlier, one of the the wettest year on record leading into the spring, and mm-hmm. and it started flooding in the Batcher country. I think in late January or early February. I, I had heard reports on some areas uh, starting in December. Okay. That. That may be very, very few, but I had heard some reports as yeah. far back as December. Again, there's variation in elevation, yeah. so the lower ones would have flooded sooner. Yeah. And they're still flooded. They're still flooded. So we had that December, January flood, the winter flood that next year, you know, based on our analysis, can be positive. Mm-hmm. Spring flood that in a given year, not so bad. Summer flood, generally bad, but we've had all that at one time right? in one year. Right. And this is kind of a, a maybe a, a not, I don't know if we call it a game changer. It's a uh, milestone event. Certainly an anomaly. Uh, we, we hope. We Yeah, yeah. Historic, relative to historic records, it's an anomaly now. Yes. It may not be an anomaly in the future. Yeah. So, yeah, what, what we're concerned about is that um, in the previous more normal flooding, even the summer flooding, it, it wasn't near this duration, near this extent. Um, for people that know Mississippi, and we say the Delta and the South Delta, I mean, Steve, we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres that are flooded. Mm -hmm. And so that acute stress that happens every year has now turned into chronic stress. Yeah. And so we're not saying regional, uh, we're not saying throughout the entire Mississippi Delta or Louisiana Delta, but there are certain, certainly some really big places, um, big expanse of acreage that's been enduring flooding for now we're at, at some places six months yeah and it's and, not looking good and because it was so so wet this year the you know that's hard to get the inside outside levee thing but the state side of yeah. the levee where normally it's dry it's rained so much that the farmers in the normal dry area haven't even been able to plant soybeans because it's just too, it's rained so much. And they haven't, so the deer that are leaving the batch are going over the levee normally into soybean fields, there are not even any soybean fields. Right. So you have all these deer concentrated, and yeah, they, they, they're able to get some, some of the spring green up, and, but they're not getting to go back and experience it on their home range. It, they're, they're all stuck there and, and for six months. Yeah. So you've got this chronic stress. And then if you look at the South Delta, and when we refer to Delta, uh, you know, here in Mississippi, we're talking about the Mississippi alluvial floodplain part of Mississippi. 
and and if you're a um, water ecologist you, you know it's not technically a delta it, it's yeah. an alluvial floodplain but we call it the delta yep good or bad i don't bad. know the history of that but by golly that's the way it is it, it's, it's the, the delta, delta. <laughs> but in the south delta kind of is where the water drains from all this rain we've had, it drains down to the South Delta, and mm-hmm. it's collected there. Yep. And there's a lot of, we don't need to go into all the stories, but there's, there's some supplemental levees down there that are working really well now as a dam Yeah. to hold this water that's kind of flowing south through the Delta down towards the Yazoo River. And there's something like 500,000 acres that are flooded right now so the deer that normally would have gone somewhere from the batcher come over the levee into the south delta well now there's no place to go at all it's not the soybean fields haven't been planted the soybean fields are underwater right and so now all those deer are stuck on the levee mm-hmm. they don't even have a place to go and it's uh I know I had never thought about this um, or even tried to envision it, and I probably will not be able to paint a good picture, but just think, Steve, you've got the the Mississippi River, this huge wall of water now, just like in 2011. Well, that's not the only river in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So you have these tributaries that drain into the Mississippi River. Mm Mm-hmm. So if you can imagine, you have all these tributaries coming, you know, uh, one of, you know we've got the, the Yazoo River, mm-hmm. uh, Big Black, you know, all these other rivers that are also in the Delta that ultimately drain into the Mississippi River. Mm-hmm. Well, what happens is when the Mississippi River gets so high, there's nowhere for the water from those tributary rivers, there's nowhere for it to go. Yeah, It meets a wall of water in the Mississippi River Channel. And, and that, that floods back, backing up and backing up, mm-hmm. and that's how you end up with half a million or more acres underwater. Yeah, the backwater flooding. The backwater flooding, right? Now, the Corps of Engineers is by law required to manage the flood situation, and they have these uh, gates along the the levee that, uh, much to the chagrin of people on the other side of those gates, sometimes they open them, mm-hmm. and there's. Uh, there's some flooding events that are designed to control lower Mississippi River flooding. They're letting water out into the Louisiana side and, and over into the Mississippi side that are flooding parts, other parts that are impacting people in very significant ways. And, right. and we've we've heard on the news about uh, the seafood industry and, and off the coast of Mississippi because the Mississippi River flood release down through Mississippi out into the Gulf of Missis- off of Mississippi's coast is the fresh water is killing the oysters and the shrimp and, and so devastating our, our local seafood mm-hmm. uh, industry. So there's, yeah. there's, there's so many human components that are bad on top of the deer. Right. Um, now, I guess we're, we're not going to be able to tell people what the event what this event has done to the deer population because we don't know. We don't know yet. It hasn't even ended yet. I'm going to venture that it's not positive. Yes. I think that is absolutely clear that what we're only, what we need to fill in the blanks here is how bad is it bad going is it to be, be for the deer population. Yeah. And, and we can't even say um, that it's going to be uniform throughout the Delta or the Mississippi River floodplain. It'll I, I would speculate that some places everything's going to be okay. Um, it'll prob- probably be a similar effect like when we have flooding every year. You envision the worst is going to happen, and it's not quite that bad. Mm-hmm. So I, I bet there's going to be some places like that. But unlike in the past, there will be some places that, that are impacted. Significantly. Yeah, uh, in both reproduction and antler development yes and and we've done some uh, survey work with the mississippi department of wildlife fisheries and parks william mckinley the deer project leader for mississippi Uh, we've ridden around that south delta uh, 
levee system and, and looked, and, and the deer are in pretty rough shape. Yeah, there's some, some pitiful sights, but kind of break, breaks your heart. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the state agency has uh, recently uh, changed their regulations uh, in some of that area, a good chunk of that area. Supplemental feeding has been forbidden for the last two years because that's an area of CWD mm-hmm. occurrence. We've had two positives down there. So people can't feed. Well, these deer up on the levee with no place to go are literally starving. Yep. And so the agency has uh, set up a mechanism where private landowners can get a permit under certain circumstances and conditions to supplementally feed for short term to get the deer through so they're not as much starvation. Right. And I've seen on social media a lot of people complaining well, it's going to promote CWD, and but if you were out there and saw the condition of the deer, uh, they're already super concentrated on these levee systems. So you're already promoting disease transfer. What yeah. we're talking about, what the state I think has decided to do is, let's just try to allow people to save as many deer as they can, and in theory, it might increase the potential spread of CWD, but. That's already happening if there is any more positive deer in that area. They're already sharing through the direct contact anyway. And based on sampling, you know, that, that's all we can do with CWD or looking at harvest data is a sample. And based on the last two years of CWD sampling in that region, um, there have been two positives yes. from that county. So based on the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of deer that have been sampled, we can surmise the prevalence rate is very, very low. Very, very low, yes. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, the concentration, Steve, I agree, was going to happen anyway. Anybody like you that's seen what is going on, the concentration of deer, which is always bad for disease, um, but that was already happening. Yeah. There's no way around it. Yeah. Yeah. So the state's agency is trying to help a bad situation by modifying. They're not requiring supplemental feeding. They're just allowing. There were some landowners that were just really concerned, and and based on the condition of the deer, they they decided to move forward with allowing them on a short-term basis, temporary short-term basis, to do it. Right. And and I personally support that Mm -hmm. that move by the agency. I'll tell you one thing, Steve, is I'm, I'm trying to have a, a teaching moment here. This is uh, tragic what's going on, but one thing I know I've pestered you a few times about uh, some photographs of deer that are in awful, awful physical condition, surrounded by beautiful green grass. Mm-hmm. And it just brings up the point that whenever we're our articles, our workshops, our seminars, our podcasts, that... Deer don't eat Johnson grass. Yes. And so you look out there, and there's this vegetation that's knee-high, waist-high, but uh, but deer are not cows. Yes. And so, you know, they eat broadleaf plants, and they don't eat those grasses. The fescue or Bermuda or Bahia or Johnson grass, mm-hmm. they can't utilize it like a cow would. There's a good bit of grass on those levees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The deer starving to death mm-hmm. eating grass. Yeah. So. Trying to make the best of it. Yeah. So, well, we hate to end on a, a, a sad note, this podcast, but we just don't know where it's going. Uh, we'll come back and talk about it sometime later when we have more harvest data from this fall and we know the full extent of the flood. Yeah. And we've got a lot of things, you know, CWD updates. We, we need to, you know, after we're done traveling, we'll do some more podcasts and we hope people will. Hang around and, and listen to future downloads. Uh, share it with your friends on social media. And subscribe. And subscribe. If you yeah. like what you hear, subscribe. Yeah, and, and we're not talking about a pay subscription. It's just subscribe to the, the downloads so that when we release one, it just goes to your phone yeah, automatically. Yeah, to your podcast service. Um, the most common one is iTunes, but it could be Stitcher or Google Play, but... Yeah, subscribe just so it's automatically delivered to whatever device. You're probably a mobile device or something else. So yeah, let you know when there's a You'll have one. it in your inbox ready to go. Because we don't do this 
we don't put them out every Wednesday. Yeah. You know, we, we got, we're busy. We're busy. We're busy. And, and we're, you know, I'm, I'm glad uh, we did this, Steve. It's after hours right now, but July is always like this for us. I have a lot of commitments I do with 4-H in the summer, and you've got, you typically are doing a lot of conferences and so forth. So you and I aren't even going to be in the same building, I don't think, for about six weeks in the future. Just you're about. gone, I'm gone, you're, you know, yeah. kind of back and forth. So um, that's why we, this is so important uh, this this flood and what's going on and it's not the end of the story and we'll we'll touch base again uh, hopefully within two or three months and we'll have a better idea of, of what's going on and and hopefully we can find some success stories yes with all this and we'll at least be able to you know give be more informative next time right and we hope you know we provide some good context to flooding and, and flood water management. Uh, we've learned a lot in the last year through these extensive analyses that we've done. Mm-hmm. And now we just we just have this milestone event and we'll see what happens. That's right. So good talking to you. Safe travels. All right. Same to you, Steve. Good talking to you. Teach those four H kids lots of good wildlife stuff. Wildlife habitat. That's what we'll teach them. Good deal. All take, right. Take care my friend. Thanks a bunch. Good day listeners. We're glad you joined us today and hope you learned something valuable about deer management. If you have questions about this podcast or a question about a topic we haven't discussed, please log on to msudeerlab.com, click on the Deer University tab, and send us your questions. We'll get to them as soon as possible. In closing, we want to thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. We also want to thank the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowments that support deer research and education.